in a time space. In other words, you could have been saved for 40 years. That doesn't put you in chair three. Chair three represents somebody that's growing in Jesus. You could still be in chair two. And you could have been saved for 40 years. The, the hope is that, that we're going to keep rotating around this table. Next month, we're going to talk about investing. And, and so the primary focus will be chairs two and three. But for this week, we're still setting out to reach the lost. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 5. It's where we were last week, but we'll be in a different verse. Luke chapter 5. We're going to look at a story in verse 17. This is a story that's also recorded in Matthew. It's also recorded in Mark. It's the story of Jesus healing the paralytic. It begins in verse 17. Now before this happens, though, I just want to give you some background. Jesus has started his ministry, and he's been doing some great things. He's, he's begun to chose his disciples. Already he's been healing people. Already he's been casting out demons. Already as it, that his fame is beginning to spread as far as being a person who sets people free from physical ailment. I tell you that for this purpose because as he's meeting in this house, people are not even going to be able to get in the house because of that. It was why Jesus many times after he healed somebody said, go and don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. So here we are in verse 17. It says, on one of those days he was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. Now there was other people who had come. There are people no doubt crowded in, as you read the other accounts, crowded in because of what he's done. They were looking also for a touch of his hand. But it's important to note, though, that there were Pharisees and there were teachers of the law there. I want you to think of it this way. There were skeptics and there were critics, right? They were there. They were just looking for what's, what's happening with this guy and is he legit and what's he about from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal side note real quick when Jesus was on this earth we've talked about this before but I just for those of you that don't know this and you looked at that and like what's that about when Jesus was on this earth he was fully God yes but he was fully man but as he operated as he moved as he went about this earth he operated with the same relationship with the father modeling what we were to do that was not doing anything that his father didn't tell him to do first and only operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that led him in the wilderness. You'll see after that, and Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to do these things. So when he did things, it was only because God directed him to first. He never acted on his own, and he always acted in the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So when it says that the power was on him to heal, he was filled with the Holy Spirit in order to heal at this moment. There was purpose there. There was people gathered. And although this is the only healing that's recorded, there were probably others. There probably were. But here's the story. True story, by the way. And behold, some men, the book of Mark tells us there's four of them, were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. They were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, emphasis on their, I believe that there was not just those four men, I believe that, that, that faith also included that man that was laying there. I'll tell you why later, but I, I believe it was all five of them. Not just the ones that brought him in, but the one who was in the bed. When he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Exactly, right? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise and pick up your bed and go home. 
And immediately he rose before them. He picked up what he had been lying on and he went home glorifying God. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. There's a lot in that story. There's a lot that we're going to look at there. But the first thing I want to ask you is when's the last time you ripped the roof off for somebody? When is the last time you as a believer cared enough about someone to go out of your way to bring them to church? When's the last time you invited somebody? Really, that's why, the, that's why we handed those cards out. We want to just, not just so you'd have something to give them, but just so you'd be reminded, hey, you know what, I should invite this guy to church. That's the beginning of the invitation, right? We talked about last week, that was the joyous invitation of Matthew, where he went out and said, I'm going to throw a party, I'm going to bring the disciples in, and I'm going to bring my old friends in, the tax collectors and sinners, and they're going to get to meet. So with excitement, you could hand that card out. With excitement, you can invite someone to church. What if they needed you to bring them? Would you bring them? What if they lived out of the way? What if they live way out of town? We, we're in a place where our county is pretty widespread. What if they lived in Bassinger, but they wanted to come to church? Would you go out of your way to go get them? See, we want to, we want to be a people that would do that, Amen. We want to be a people that would look to that. These men loved their brother so much that they picked him up and they carried him, four of them, climbed up on the roof with him. That was no easy task in and of itself. When they couldn't get inside because it was so tight, climbed up on the roof, began to remove parts of the roof, parts of the tile, separating it. Can you imagine if you were inside a building? You're packed in shoulder to shoulder. There's Jesus. He's teaching. And all of a sudden, parts of the roof start falling on your head. And it's opening up. And then they lower this guy down. Right in front of him. Now, it should be noted, and it needs to be noted, they brought the man to Jesus to heal him. Right? They brought him to Jesus looking for a physical healing. And there's absolutely, absolutely nothing wrong with us coming to the Lord looking for physical healing. As a matter of fact, I would venture to say that most of the time that we cry out to God, it's for physical. But Jesus didn't address the physical immediately. He addressed the spiritual. He went right to the spiritual need of the man. Right to the spiritual need of the man. Right to the heart of the matter. Heart of the matter. Listen, if you're in chair three and chair four, I want you to listen to this. I want you to write this down. It's going to appear on the screen. Our need, our need to have our sin forgiven is far greater than any physical need we will ever have. Our need to have our sin forgiven is far greater than any physical need we'll ever have. Now that applies to all three chairs. But the reason I said specifically two and three, for those of you who know Christ, I want you to understand something. Because this is where we begin to get a different perspective. And we begin to take a different perspective. Because we, we so often we cry out for healing. And listen to me right now. We serve a God that still heals. Amen? There are people in this room that have been healed. There are people in this room that have seen him heal. We know it. There's also times when we've cried out for his healing and he's not answered. Or his answer was no, not in that way. And he chooses to heal in a different way. But here's the shift in your mind thinking that I want you to think about. Here's the shift. I had a group in my house for Wednesday night, my, my Bible study on Wednesday night, our salt group. In that group, there was about half of the people in there were northern visitors, and about half were from Okeechobee area or surrounding areas. If you're, if you're a northern visitor at Mortal Life this morning, raise your hand. Praise God. We love you. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. But I explained to them then, I, I used this illustration to prove a, a point, not from this, we were in First Peter, but to prove the same point. This is not our home. 
You see, those folks, they have a real home up north somewhere. Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, Tennessee, Alabama. We got people from all over different, different states that come down and visit with us, and we're so thankful for them. But they have a permanent home there. They come down here, and they stay in a temporary home. And while they're here, they move about, and they live life, and it's great, and they socialize with us, and we love them, and they're having a great time. But this is not their home. That's their home. So if something happened to this home, if their camper, if God forbid, if their camper burned down, if a, if a storm came, if something happened and this home was no more, while it would sadden them, they'd just go home. Right? If you're a believer here, this world, this shell of a body that we walk, this is not your home. Amen? It is not your home. It is temporary. It will run out. The Lord set the number of man's days at 120 years. I hadn't seen many 120-year-olds, but my grandpa will be 99 in a couple of weeks. 99. We've got a lady that comes here some Sunday morning. She's 106. Praise God. Praise God. But eventually, this body is going to wear out. But for the believer, this world is not your home. So it gives us a different perspective when we start to pray for ailment and illness. Even if it's permanent illness and illness, ailments and illness, right? It should give us a different perspective as we cry out for folks that are, that are hurting, as we cry out for even folks that are dying. Our primary concern, everybody listening? Eyes up here. Our primary concern should be, do they know Jesus? Do they know him? Because if not, this world right here, it's all there is until they go to, last week we talked about heaven and hell. Hell is very real. Heaven is just as real. And everybody in this room is going to live forever. I told you that last week. But you're either going to live forever with Jesus or you're going to live forever without him. And it's a place of torment, and you don't want to go there. It was not meant for you. And if you go there, it's not because God sent you. It's because you chose to. Because he wants you to choose him. He gave you a free will to make a choice, to make a determination. I, I always think back to that song, some of this will date me. And some of you will understand and some of you will remember this band and, 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 and know we're in church, but the band was called Cheap Trick. And they had a song that said, I want you to. Exactly. That's what God does. He says, I want you to want me back. That's why he gave you free will. Yes? Can everybody follow that line of thinking? He didn't make you a robot that would just automatically choose him. He put you on this earth, and from the fall of man from the very beginning, his redemptive plan was for you to want him back. He was going to provide a way, but you had to want him back. You had to choose him. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So Christ's perspective when he saw this man, he saw that he was paralyzed. The men that lowered him down, their perspective was healing. We want to see him walk. But the first thing that Jesus does is he says, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. You see, he didn't come here just to heal people. Look, flip back over maybe a page to Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18... Jesus goes in, he goes in to, to, to share, to teach in the synagogue as he frequently did. And they handed him a scroll and he opens it up and it's Isaiah. He's reading from the prophets from Isaiah. And he turns and he reads this from Isaiah 61. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. Isaiah says to heal the brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. And he set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year 
of the Lord's favor. Now, if we, when we first read that, we think, hey, poor Jesus came to make us rich. Captives, Jesus came to set us free. Blind, Jesus came to heal our eyes. Oppressed, Jesus came to lift that oppression. He came to help us. He came to fix our physical ailments. Listen, he's not talking about physical ailments here. We have a sin problem. Our sin has made us poor. Our sin has robbed from us. Our sin has made us blind. Our sin has put us in captivity. Our, our sin oppresses us. Our sin has broken our heart. Every one of us. Why in the world would he say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven you? Why did he say that to the paralyzed? Well, he's been paralyzed. I mean, surely he gets a pass, right, God? He's had a rough time all of his life. Now, now listen very carefully. All indications are, as we read this story, this man was completely in his right mind. As Jesus healed him physically, he stood up and he began to proclaim and give glory back to God. He could speak. If, if I be, Personal belief, okay, personal belief. And I, I think there's some things that we can point back to in Scripture. Little babies that pass away before they have knowledge of anything or, or the mentally handicapped that might not have knowledge or be able to understand the truths about God. I believe that, that Jesus takes care of them. Fully, I, I really do. As, as, the, as the baby dies, David says, I can't, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. That baby even that was born in sin, yes, but he, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. So I, I believe that, that God takes care of that. But if you're listening to my voice this morning, and you can comprehend the words that are coming out of my mouth, you need a Savior. And so do I. Every one of us. And that man that was paralyzed, that was laying there in front of him, needed his sins forgiven worse than he needed to be able to walk. As we begin praying for people, and we always, man, we cry out for miracles here. We do all the time. We cry out in faith, and we ask God for the miraculous. And as we pray for people in that vein, as we pray for people in that circumstance, we, we pray expecting, and we pray in faith, and we ask God, and, and, and we push forward, and we believe Him for things, and the Lord answers when the Lord will answer and how the Lord will answer because he's God and we're not. But we'll always cry out for those things. But I believe with all of my heart that the greater miracle is when that person that we're praying for is able to say, even if he does not, even if he does not answer that prayer, even if he does not heal me, even if he does not deliver me out of the fire even if he does not I'll not bow down to the enemy I'll serve God forever even if he does not I'll trust him even if he does not I'll serve him Jesus says it says when he saw their faith they explained they expressed an extreme amount of faith to bring him in there to rip the roof off and to lower him down but I think it was his faith even why Jesus spoke and said, your sins are forgiven. Now he healed him too, physically. But first spiritually. First he addressed the spiritual. Every one of us in this room are in need of spiritual healing. First unto salvation, and then a continued washing because we still walk about in this world in this flesh suit and we battle back and forth and there's a constant battle going on between the spirit within us and the flesh that we walk in, isn't there? That battle is over our soul. It happens in our mind most of the time. There's a constant need for renewing of the mind constantly. So there's a constant need to live in repentance. But this morning I want to speak for the rest of this sermon primarily to those that don't know him yet primarily there why did the paralytic need his sins forgiven because all of us need our sins forgiven right Romans 3 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God all okay are you an all 
Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some liberty here. I want you all to listen, okay? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Does that include me? Does it include you? Then can I say, for I have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Would you say that with me? For I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us. Every one of us in the same boat. You see, there, between man and God, from the fall of man, our sin has separated us from a holy God. All the way back to Adam and Eve. Do we have a picture of that, maybe? Hey, look at there. There's man. There's sin right down the middle. My sin separated me from a holy God. From the very beginning. Everybody in here is a son of Adam, daughter of Eve. My sin, our sin, separates us from a holy God. Listen, we are helpless to do anything about that sin on our own. There is no remedy for sin on this earth. We can go to all the doctors that we want to. When we have a physical ailment, we can go to doctors. And sometimes God uses doctors to heal, doesn't he? Sometimes he uses medicine to heal. Praise him, that's great. You can't get a medicine to heal your sin there is nothing that covers it but the blood of Jesus. There is nothing that covers it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And there's a penalty for my sin. Romans 6.23 tells me that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, my sin separated me from a holy God and there's a penalty for that. The penalty is death that's the penalty without Christ that's the penalty if, if the Lord had decided you know what I'm going to just start over when he came down and saw Moses if he just said I'm wiping him out I'm starting over many different times in scripture you see as his anger burned against the children of Israel and I'm thinking how many times his anger burned against Carrie but oh but his grace oh but his grace our sin what is sin? Sin is to miss the mark. Which we've all done that. And you may think, oh, I've never really done anything bad. Please, please listen to me, okay? It, because we're all in the same boat, I want you to listen to me. If you've ever stolen anything, even a pencil from work, if you've ever stolen time from your boss, if you've ever lied to anyone. Have you ever told a lie? Well, I never really, I've never really done anything really bad, Carrie. I've never, I've never committed murder. Uh, listen, Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, he began to explain, here's the letter of the law, here's the spirit of the law. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not commit murder. The spirit of the law says, if you've ever hated your brother in your heart, you ever had hate, hatred against someone in your heart, then you've committed a murder already in your spirit there. before, As far as he's concerned. If you ever looked at a woman, or you could flip it as a, at a man with lust in your eye, then you've committed adultery already in your heart. That, that, we're all guilty, right? We're all guilty. But Jesus. But Jesus. Because we're all guilty, you know, here's what happens at the world, in, in the world's eyes. The world says... You're more guilty than me. The world says, you've messed up a whole lot more than I have. And you, listen, that can be said of, of me. You, you could say, you're more guilty than me, Pastor, and you'd probably be right. Because I know the sin I've committed. My sin was against him. It's always before me. But his blood has covered it. His blood has washed it clean. His blood has washed it clean. So no matter what you've done, and I'll add to this, no matter how bad it was, because the enemy will also tell you, not your sin. No, your sin, it can't be covered up. If they knew what you did, if they knew, if that big screen all of, up there all of a sudden started showing all of my sin, I'd be so embarrassed I'd crawl out of here. I would. He knows, but there's nothing so big, there's no sin so bad 
There's no place so dark that his grace and his blood doesn't cover it still and doesn't reach down there and pick you up and rescue you and wash over you and cleanse you. That's what happened at the cross. And he didn't wait for you to clean yourself up. Romans 5.8 says that God fully demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved you so much that he didn't wait on you to clean yourself up. Anybody ever, ever determined, you know what, I, I, I think I need to start, I need to clean myself up a little bit. I need, a little, I need carry 2.0. I need to work on that. I'm going to start going back to the gym. I'm going I'm I'm to stop doing this and start doing this. And I'm going to quit eating this and quit drinking this. And I'm just going I'm just, I'm, I'm just to make a better me. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. But his blood, it washes clean. It makes us a brand new creation. If you're, if you're listening this morning... And you came in here and you're not sure if you had a relationship with him. And you, may, you may believe that there's a God. The demons believe. They know that there's a God. They tremble about it. They're terrified of him, but they believe. That's the first thing. Every time Jesus, when he walked this earth, every time he came in contact with a demon, they'd begin to shout out who he was and say, shut up. Hush. He'd have to quiet them because they knew exactly who he was. They'd known him since the dawn of time. Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He always was. He always was. That's why his sacrifice, because see under the old system, in the Old Testament, under the old covenant, sacrifice had to be made for our sin. So every time we'd sin, every time they'd sin, which was frequent, think about how often you sin. They would bring sacrifice, and they'd have to bring two pigeons or a goat or a, a, a cow or a, a lamb, and they, they're constantly, blood just flowed, blood just flowed, blood flowed from the altar constantly. And then they go right back out and repeat the cycle again. Absolutely unchanged on the inside. Absolutely unchanged. But God's plan from the very beginning hear me God's plan all along Jesus wasn't an afterthought and the redemptive plan of the gospel it was not plan B God's plan from the beginning was to provide the perfect sacrifice perfect in every way 2 Corinthians 5 21 says he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, he took that which was perfect, Jesus Christ on the throne, came here this earth, condescended to wear a flesh suit, to put on a suit like this and walk this earth as a man, still perfect and spotless without sin, to take on my sin, so that I could take on his righteousness. What a deal, right? What an incredible, incredible exchange. From death to life. From guilty to innocent. He, the innocent, shed his blood so that I could become the innocent. Best lawyer ever. Best ever. Best ever. He loves you that much. He loves you because he loves you because he loves you because he loves you. Flip, flip over with me to Ephesians 2 real quick. I love the way it says it. Luke, Luke started quoting it this morning. He, he didn't know I was going to preach from here, but at one point he started and he said, <laughs> verse 4. I didn't give you this one, by the way. I'm sorry. This is chapter 2, verse 4. The very beginning of chapter 2, he's explaining where we're at. That, that Listen, uh, our sin, it, we're dead in our trespasses. We're dead in our transgressions. We were dead. Our spirits were dead. And, and we were getting what was coming to us. Verse 4, but God, 
Oh, I love that but God, don't you? But God, big G, not little G. But my MasterCard, nope, can't fix it. But my bank account, nope, can't fix it. But my doctor, nope. But God, big G, being rich in mercy. But God, being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says, for by grace... If you underline anything in your Bible, if this one's not, you might want to underline it. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And then verse 9 goes on to say it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, it's not of works lest any man should boast. In other words, you, you'd brag about it if you could do it yourself. But the point I'm making today is God's grace poured out for me provided salvation. That's what, his, what happened on the cross his mercy, and I want you to understand the difference between this, God being rich in mercy, his mercy says, I don't get what I do deserve. You with me? I don't get what I do deserve. And Romans 6.23 says that I, I'm guilty. And the wages of sin is death. By the way, the wages of sin is still death. It's always death. The, the way, you mean my present sin? Yeah. It's always death. It might be death to a relationship. It might be death to a marriage. It might be death to, to a job. But my sin always has a ripple effect, still has a consequence, and it's still death. It's still death. His mercy says we don't get what we do deserve. And that's death and hell. His grace poured out offers us heaven. His grace says, I'm going to adopt you into my family. His grace says, you're going to be a joint heir with Jesus. His grace says, you're my son, you're my daughter now. You're going to live with me forever in paradise. This world, it's truly stinky where we're at. Last week we talked a lot about where we're at as a nation. We'll probably visit that again next week. Because where we're at as a nation is not good. And it's not okay with God. We know that, right? It's not okay. It's not okay. But he has provided for us a way. His grace extended. Romans 10, 9 says that it comes back to our mouth. If we'll confess with our mouth, if we'll speak it out, if you'll confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I shall be saved. Verse 10 right after that. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see what happens is we have faithed him. We have put our faith in him. Speaking it is great but when he says this verse, when, when Paul writes this about salvation, he's talking about more than just praying a prayer and not meaning it. This, this is what I spoke to last week. Some of us, when we were young or maybe old, we prayed a prayer because somebody, somebody gave you an opportunity and you said, yep, uh, sign me up, I don't want to go to hell, I'll pray that prayer. And you prayed that prayer, but you know more meant it than the man in the moon. And we know you didn't mean it because your life never changed. And when the Holy Spirit of the living God comes to indwell you, it will change. If the most vile demon on the face of the earth came and invaded your life, would it change you? Some of you are like, no. It probably would. It probably would. I guarantee you if the Holy Spirit of the living God comes and invades your life, it will change you. There will be transformation. There will be change. Perfection? No. Not until we reach him. But a desire to change and a love for God and a desire to grow and a desire to worship Him, yes. A drawing to Him, yes. So when He says confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart 
that God raised him from the dead, that says, I'm putting my faith in you, Jesus. What you did on the cross, it was enough. It covered my sin. It canceled my sin. I believe that your grace is sufficient for me. I believe that you did exactly what you said to do. I think you came and you died to set me free. And most of all, you didn't stay dead. But you rose again on the third day and you, in doing so, conquered death in the grave. We just sang about it earlier. We just sang about it. He makes this a brand new creation. I want to close with this thought. If you're older than a certain age, you'll remember this as a hymn. If you're younger than a certain age, Casting Crown sings it. But it's both. It's the gospel in one verse of a song. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, O oh, glorious day. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He lived, he came on this earth and lived and said, I love you. I love you because I love you because I love you because I love you. And if you choose to not choose me back, it breaks my heart. And he's patient with us because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He loves you that much. He died to cancel your sin that you couldn't cancel. He rose again, conquering death in the grave, which sets us free. We're no longer bound by that. He justified us. We've been, we went to court. He says, not guilty. Not guilty. That's my boy right there. This is what will happen when you stand before him in heaven. Jesus is going to step forward and say this. He's, he's one of mine. He's one of mine. She's one of mine. Mm. Oh. Can't wait for that day. Can't wait for that day. If you're here and you know him this morning, my challenge to you in the coming weeks is that you will take very seriously the fact that we're not long for this world. This world's not our home, but we're also not long. It, it won't be long before he's coming back. I just, it, there's too much going on around us. There's too many things happening. It's not going to be long. And whether you're still alive when he returns or whether your life ends tomorrow, which it could, because we're not guaranteed even this afternoon, right? You need a Savior. He loves you. So if you're a believer, I want you to take serious the people that you know and love and come in contact with. And I want you to invite them. Invite them to church, but invite them to Jesus. Introduce them to the Savior. And you may say, Pastor Kerry, I don't know all those verses you just said. That, that was the Roman road, typically the Roman road. And we'll talk about that some in the coming weeks because I'm going to teach you how to share your faith. But here's the thing. If you're a believer, you have had an experience with Jesus, right? You've been saved. Just tell him that. Just tell him what he's done in your life. Share your personal experience. This is what God's done for me. This is what he's done for me. If you're here this morning and you don't know him, today can be the single greatest day of your life. I'm talking about the single greatest day of your life. The day you get reborn. The day you get set free. The day Jesus does for you what he said he came to do for you. And he waits on you to say yes. And to choose him back. I want you to stand with me. I want you to bow your heads. And I'm going to ask, first of all, as our heads are bowed, Luke's going to play something softly behind us. As our heads are bowed, I want you to ask right now God to take his searchlight 
and shine it deep into the recesses of your heart. Lord, shine your light into me. Examine me. Paul says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. I want you to ask the Lord right now, Lord, do I, am I yours? Because Matthew chapter 7 tells us there's going to be some that will stand before him and say, well, Lord, I taught, I, I used to preach. I taught Sunday school. I, I did all kinds of things in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You didn't just know me. You, you knew about me, but you didn't know me. So ask him right now, Lord, do I really know you? Do I have a relationship with you? Now, I don't ask that question to make you afraid or to, or to talk you into something or talk you out of something. We, we worship him in spirit and truth. And the truth is, if you've made that decision, if you chose him, he chose you. You hear me? He actually chose you first. But if you meant business with him, he meant it with you. And you're his child. And you can stand on the truth of that. You can stand on the truth of that. But if you're not sure, if you're not sure, don't die wondering. If you're not sure, don't go to lunch wondering today. If you're not sure, today again can be the greatest day of your life. The weight, the weight of sin that's heavy in your life, lift it off the blood of Jesus. If you're here and you don't know him, but you'd like to, nobody looking around, just lift a hand. If you don't know him, but you'd like to today, today's the day of your salvation. Just lift a hand and hold it up for me. This is so important, folks. It's so important. It's so important. I cannot do it for you. Your parents can't do it for you. Pastor, my daddy was a preacher. God can't be a grandfather. He's only a father. He wants to be your father. One more opportunity. Just lift a hand high. Please... The enemy right now, if you're gripping that chair so hard that your knuckles are white, <laughs> that's because the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. And he's saying, you need to raise your hand. And you're arguing with him and say, well, if he asks one more time, then I might. Well, I'm asking again. Anybody here want to say yes to Jesus today? Praise God. Can I have a lady right here? Friend. Praise God. Anywhere else today, single greatest day of your life. Single greatest day. Heads bowed and eyes closed. As a chair two or a chair three, as a believer that's here. I want you to ask the Lord right now to give you a, because the days are not long, to give you a burning desire to share your faith. Here's what he does. He will equip you to do so. He will. He's going to equip you. We're going to equip you. We're going to give you some tools that you can do that with. But you got people that you love, and they need to hear truth about Jesus. And you can do it in love. I pray that today I shared it in love. I pray, pray that you understood today that I love you and Jesus loves you way more than that. Way more than that. So, Lord, we love you. And I thank you, Father, for the one that said yes to you this morning. I thank you, Lord, for those last week, during the week, that, that chewed on what was shared. And, Lord, they said yes to you. So, Lord, we're celebrating, Lord, with you as the angels in heaven celebrate today over one soul that repented, over one that, that said yes to you. Lord, we celebrate with you. And Lord, we ask God that you would, you would burn it deep within our soul that the days are not long. The urgency of the hour, the urgency of the time right now that we're in. And Lord, we'd share with great zeal, with great fervor, the truth of who you are and what you came for and what you've done. So I tell you this morning, Jesus, that I love you, that we love you, oh, 
thank you, Lord, for meeting with us this morning. Thank you for the moving of your spirit, Lord. We bless your name. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Sing along with us but one verse here, and then Luke's going to dismiss us. Let's sing this together. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. The salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. Thank you for the one who's now in your fold. We celebrate, Lord, that new salvation. Can we just give a round of applause for the new salvation this morning, church? For our new sister in Christ. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for the gospel and the power that it is. As we go out from this day, Lord, make us more like you. Give us eyes to see the people around us. We love you in your sweet name we pray. Amen and amen.